uh, can put everyone on the same page, but um, yeah. That's fine. Um, question to the group. Uh, I uploaded all my slides to the data tracker. Does do interims do not provide them to the meet echo? So typically I find them they in do. meeting material. They do. You yeah. may have to go to settings. To yeah. the, the screwdriver and I see. Uh, wrench and then you can import them because they they do they do their thing um, 15 minutes before the meeting starts. Oh, yeah, I see now. Interesting. Okay, last time, I, probably my coach edited it, so I was like, cool, they're already there. Um, let me try to find a close button and to refresh this one here. That did not do the trick. So it says decks are ready to be shared. But they are not there. Okay, last time this was working brilliantly. I was actually happy. Oh, and now it works. Okay, it's just there's, there's some seems to be some delay here. If I press refresh one more time, it works. Wonderful. Let's go with the introduction. We are already one minute in. Did you propose my slides so that they wind up in the record here? Nah. I'm still trying to share them now. Let me. Have you accepted share. them? Yeah, let, let me let me get the, the, the most, the easiest thing first, that, that, that these are mine. If you propose them, I can uh, refresh them here and then the and, uh, meeting. Thanks. You have so to Michael, accept you feel... them and then you can refresh them. Yeah, but, uh, but I don't see something to accept yet. Okay. Just a second. Did I just successfully share the slides? I wonder if that worked out. Look there. I, I'm F5ing the meetings materials, but we can um, start now, I think. Uh, welcome, everybody, to the IoT Ops Virtual Interim. Um, we have a overlap with um, the core working group. That's due to smart share scheduling. I suppose that's up to IoT Ops chairs because we can't distinguish 60 minutes from 90 minutes. And now... 30 minutes spillover of uh, core are happening here in IoT Ops. That's not a huge problem because I think some of the audience will be uh, the same. Um, so this will be recorded. Uh, I'm pretty sure everybody knows the note well. This is an official IETF meeting, so uh, the mobile applies, especially with uh, code of conduct and copyrights. Please read the BSPs if you're not uh, familiar with them. Also, um, only say things that you think uh, that other people should say to you in the same way. So be nice. That's always a good way to treat each other. Um, having said that, we uh, have a standard procedure here. Um, the, uh, I'm Hank Burkholz. I'm your. Um, I'm one of the co-chairs. Alexey Minikov is uh, the other co-chair, uh, currently absent, but hopefully incoming at the bottom of the hour. We uh, have a Zulip. Uh, formerly known as Java, no, formerly was Java, and that's, at the moment we have Zulip. Um, if you could have a uh, scribe for the chat, uh, that would be helpful if there are chat comments. Are there, I know we are like with 13 participants, it's not the biggest crowd ever. Uh, anybody here volunteering for uh, minute scribes? The link is here, also on the data tracker, of course. So this is a, a cricket pause, but I th unfortunately I think we can't really uh, continue. And also, uh, uh, we can't really stress that uh, presenters do the minutes. So typically, I would on. Sorry. I volunteered, and so I'll volunteer again with the mute off. <laughs> oh, I see. Okay, thank you. So these were uh, muted crickets. Uh, excellent. Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> so you probably uh, found the meat echo because you're here. The link is on the slides also. And uh, there are some, um, yeah, basically all these links can be found on the data tracker at the material meeting material page. So we have a agenda for today. Um, we are in the midst of the uh, working group, uh, sorry, of the meeting uh, at Ministry Lab. We, we, we settled with a scribe. Um, I already highlighted that we have the spillover from core. Um, and forever enshrined here is that chairs are only as smart as they can get. <laughs> and I don't know exactly who will be the presenter for the core item, but we've scheduled until the bottom of the hour, plus maybe five minutes of the initiative that I just took up. Um, so with no further ado, who will be presenting on the constraint joint proxy? Oh, it's Michael. Okay, Michael, the floor is yours. Yeah, uh, did the button where I asked to share work? I think you have to prove it. Let me first remove that one and let me check. I don't see a request yet. Oh, may, may, I might have done the exact opposite. I will do, I have big fingers. <laughs> I have a touch screen here, so uh, close. Okay. Um, so I'm going to jump in the middle of the slides and use them as, as background more than, uh, top to bottom. These slides, I did upgrade, load them, Hank, if you want to put them in the minute somewhere, but, um, um, they're from, uh, July. Um, so, um, we have the situation, um, in Anima, um, with our constraint IOT onboarding process. Uh, where we have a new device. This is diagram is repeated twice here in this page. New device, which we call the pledge. And it reaches out to find uh, a helper node called a join proxy. Um, and uh, the join proxy is going to uh, uh, transmit the traffic from this clear network, which for which there is no encryption and no access control, uh, selectively onto this um, protected network through potentially through other nodes in the middle to what we call a registrar or a JRC, join registrar and coordinator. Coordinator because it does some other other functions in the uh, 802.15.4 uh, space as well. Um, so um, th there's a couple of things that that matter here. Um, let's don't forget, don't worry about about the protocol or how it works because they're not relevant for this discussion. Um, there is a discovery protocol over here where the P learns about possible J's. And there's an, also a discovery protocol over here where the J's learn about existence of the R's. Um, and we have three ways we can do this. Um, we can do this with uh, GRASP, which is RFC 8990. Um, and that's appropriate for some environments and inappropriate for others. Uh, we can do this with MDNS, um, and that works pretty well over here um, and works less well over here where it's a multi-hop mesh uh, because of, of uh, certain other attributes, but they can be made to work um, there. And we can do it with co-op resource discovery, um, and which essentially is also multicast um, uh, throughout this network and on this network here. Okay, so... Uh, so far, so good. It doesn't sound like it's such a big deal. Um, and for the case where this join proxy is stateful, um, it's not a big deal because uh, the, there's simply a discovery and the registrar announces itself um, and using the typical co-op uh, 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 well-known core. Um, and it all makes sense. The problem is, is that we have a different version of the, of the protocol from J to R which is stateless uh, when it runs over DTLS. Uh, RFC 9031 actually has a version where it's pure co-app um, and where the security, which is OS core, actually runs above uh, the co-app. And so uh, you can still do, um, you can still use what's called the co-app uh, extended token to essentially store the state, this guy's state as to which P is which in the network rather than in the RAM. For the DTLS case, we have created a new protocol, which is a, guess what, a UDP encapsulated protocol with some co-op in the middle. Um, and 
Uh, do I have a diagram? This is what it looks like. We changed it from some stuff over here to some stuff over here. And uh, we basically have this extra bit of, of, uh, of co-op B string, which is this pledge context message. And as long as you send it back, uh, the register sends it back to the join proxy. The join proxy can decrypt it and extract what was inside of it and figure out where the state is. And that's all fine, okay. Except for we get into this question of how does the join proxy discover the location of the registrar and what is the um, actual uh, request? So uh, prior to July, uh, we were going to return this as a co-app S, um, some funny port number here. Um, and we are going to say this resource is an RJP uh, type thing. So uh, this went through the expert reviewer who said, um, well, that's not really correct, and we don't really want to do that. Um, so now uh, what we've proposed is that this here be replaced uh, with a new scheme, uh, which is co-app JPY, um, and uh, that will register a new scheme. And then, you know, actually this doesn't belong here at all now, um, and you have to ask for it somehow. So we still get into this question of, okay, we've asked for this, this resource discovery of one particular thing and then we're going to get back something that's not really exactly uh, a co-op resource but rather is a tunnel encapsulation that will get you to that co-op resource and so the question that we're trying to discuss here is is this kosher um is this acceptable um and uh, or is it still kind of gross and we should still do something else right so those are the choices that we discussed in july and we kind of uh well we called it co-op jpy rather than just jpy um and so a little bit we're here to discuss whether you have another brilliant idea that we should apply um um for that and i think quite a few people would not like this this item they'd like to be, have a pure co-op discovery uh mechanism that's really it <laughs> That was the whole conversation uh, that we're trying to get the right people in the room to finalize whether we're okay with. Karsten. Yeah, before we <clears throat> actually attack the, the problem we have, um, what was the reason why, why RFC 8974 is not good enough for carrying this extra context? What is RFC 8975? Extended tokens. Oh, yes. The reason why we can't use extended tokens is because the co-op layer, um, let me just go back to the diagram. The co-op S layer goes from the pledge to the registrar. So the join proxy can't see it. It's embedded inside a DTLS layer. Um, if, if I may jump in here, um, it, maybe it helps Carsten to not think of the join proxy as a proxy in the co-op sense because it is not. Yeah. And it does not it use all those proxy properties that a co-op proxy has. Okay, so, so my question really is, why isn't it? <laughs> because the DTLS layer is outside and it goes from the pledge to the registrar. So okay. we could run the DTLS over another co-op layer. <laughs> okay. Um, and you know what? That to me falls in the brilliant, your brilliant idea here. Um, and we could do that, right? Um, and there's really not much difference between, to me, to be putting a co-op layer there and this JPY layer. Um, there's still some bytes we have to put in. Uh, it's more bytes, I think. Uh, I don't know exactly how many. Um, probably at least 16, I would think. What's the minimum size of a co-op header? Uh, four. Four bytes? So four bytes. So we could do co-op plus we could use extended token uh, and put our stuff there. Yeah, and another... that has the advantage of also, of also meaning that we now have a mechanism that we've already described in 9031 to do this. And quite reasonably, the code is probably identical uh, for a lot of it. 
Um, but at the other end, you have one end, you, at the other end, you either do OS core or you do DTLS and we'd have to have some way to distinguish what's happening. Um, but I'm sure we can find a, a co-op place to do that in. Okay, I don't really want to design this on the fly during this meeting. I'm, I was just trying to find out why we have this this uh, additional DTLS tunneling uh, uh, protocol, and I think I'm starting to understand mm. why. So maybe Esco should uh, make his point before I return to the microphone. Yeah, I think I, think I just wanted to react into the why not use co-op. Um, so. I think four bytes was mentioned, but if you uh, use co-op, then typically you would include a URI as well for that. So it basically gets uh, a lot much larger than there. If you uh, have a particular well-known URI, for example, you get a lot of bytes extra. And I think the idea was to keep it as small as possible. And the other remark is that actually in uh, the open thread implementation of a mesh network, uh, something similar is used as what we are discussing here. And there, uh, actually, co-op is used also for the, uh, yeah, let's say the outer layer, and and it just transports uh, DTLS within the payload, in that case. So that's also possible, but but it was not chosen for this uh, particular document. I was unaware. Could you repeat? That... Sorry, just briefly. Could you repeat what they use co-op H? I didn't get what you said. What they use as the outer layer. Yeah, that, that's simply a co-op protocol um, with with a particular URI path that is uh, predefined yes. for this purpose. So it's like like just plain uh, co-op basically, and the payload of the co-op is um, yeah that that contains then the the data that that's the DTLS data that is being relayed uh, through the network. So, so uh, uh, you know, we've changed a couple times already. I don't have a problem with changing again, I guess, because I don't have any code written that I have to uh, remove. Um, so, but to me, there's some advantage to doing whatever it is that Thread did if, if it's easily reusable. 9031 in its mechanism sets the URI path to J, okay? Um, single letter URL. Yep. Uh, with the URI host option set to six dish dot ARPA. Um, so um, I think there's space in there to define a very short kind of header um, and we could do exactly the same thing and a URI path could set be set to K or whatever it is that, you know, that would definitely distinguish the two um, while allowing, you know, uh, essentially we could reuse the same mechanism and then it really would be a co-op proxy. And you're saying that Thread is really using it as a co-op proxy? No, that's no. not the case. No, okay. it's basically, it receives the DTLS, and then um, the basically join proxy creates a new uh, co-op message as an endpoint, and then sends it to the registrar. So, and the registrar sends something back. So, there's not no co-op proxying in that sense. Not no, no, but name. we would be doing. That's what Sixfish is doing. It's creating a new um oh yeah it's not it's not really it's editing it as it goes through uh six yeah, six uh, 9031 is actually editing it but in this case we would be the joint proxy would be doing what thread is doing which is creating a new co-op layer to put the dtls in yeah i don't, don't know if we uh, want to change that uh, here uh, in in this late stage or i mean is there a benefit to changing it to co-op yeah, it makes all this problem we're discussing go away. Oh, because well. we're actually discovering a we're actually discovering a yeah. co-op service, and we're actually using the extended token. And uh, yeah, we would be we, we are kind of replacing one hack by another one. So I'm I'm not sure this this is so much uh, uh, better unless it's really uh, co-op that is going going on there. Well, we would be using the extended token. We we would be able to navigate through any other co-op proxies that happen to exist. Um, and um, 
we would, you know, so, and potentially I'm saying, I, what I'm seeing is that potentially you could have a join proxy that could do thread, could do stick stitch and could do, uh, could do constraint voucher, um, possibly all at the same time, right. Without a lot of, uh, very much code differences at all, um, for that so that really just seems like a, a win to me if if the converged if it converges that way so if so it maybe converges, i agree so so maybe esco could you um uh perhaps tell the list um um what you know point us at the at the thread mechanism and um and see whether we're all pleased by that and if so then uh it seems like that might be the right way to go because I think that it, it devolves to what we just said, which is that really use co-op. Yeah, I can uh, certainly point to the, the source code for that. So that's available. But not, not the specification spec. part. Okay. That's yeah, we point. wouldn't actually have to, to nail down the, the J or K or so because that could be in the discovery, right? Yes, yes, it could be in the discovery. And that also means the host can pick whatever uh, it likes that doesn't conflict with something else. So we wouldn't get yeah. into the whole well-known, uh, we ha you have to use well-known if it's predefined. And, and, and in particular, the, 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 um, the node could easily pick, uh, pick a dedicated port and then go with a completely empty URI path. That's completely possible. And that yes. would, again, put it back down to those four bytes of difference. Um, maybe five bytes with the extended token, but then one of those bytes would also be in the Zbor representation. So it, it would uh, be around the same. And can, are we allowed to have an empty URI host? Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, empty. Well, I think you, that... you, you, we wouldn't send it. Absent. You would, I mean, empty and uh, non, not sent. Yeah. Okay. I wonder why ninety thirty one felt they had to put that in, but I'm not sure. Anyway. Um, maybe they don't have discovery. Maybe they don't have discovery. Yeah, I think they don't have discovery. Once right. you have discovery, you never need to nail down your eyes. Okay, Great. well, let, so, let, that sounds like a good resolution to me. And um, um, it removes a custom part completely. I, I think there is one aspect. So the, the, it does help on, on parts of the discovery aspect because now we do have a resource that we discover for the thing on R that talks this UDP inside something protocol. Um, yeah. The part that it does not resolve yet is how discovery between the pledge and the join proxy works when the pledge okay. when, when the pledge discovers that there is a port on the join proxy that is really actually a UDP tunnel uh, towards the registrar. Um, yeah, but, but that's, just, think... that's, that's just basically like the pledge has discovered the registrar and and it doesn't know like like for all you know these three three things are actually collapsed into a single node and it really can't tell and that's exactly what we're trying to aim for yeah the thing is um the, the, the we, we might need to put a few constraints on what can be in the discovered content if we as, as i understand what the pledge would now do is the pledge would send a request would establish a dtls connection to fe80 colon colon something on the link on the local link yeah um, requiring of its peer that dtls certificates be presented that make it eligible for being a registrar and sending their yeah. own certificates yep. also okay yep. so then the pledge sends a, a get for well-known core to that registrar and we will then have to require that that register only advertise resources in a relative fashion because the register yes. what the registrar sees especially if the registrar is distinct from the party that undoes the the statelessness the registrar sees a request to its own ip address to 2001 debate something well known co uh, well known core and it sends back a response that may or may not encode its full uri and if it does so encode it has full uri yeah, yeah, it has, it to, has do to do the do stuff that. on the on the left, and yes. if it does the le stuff on the right, it's broken, right? And and it, it has basically, to be relative. yeah, basically, it has to know that it's sitting behind a quote very stupid um, proxy, 
because it's not even a proxy, it's a port forwarder, and it has to know that it's sitting behind a port forwarder. And, and it, knows this it knows this because it comes through DTLS. So that's okay. I mean, it can really, it can be easily said that that's the case. If there's additional layers of proxying, then I agree that it could, disasters could happen. But yeah. Um, it, uh, technically, I think it will know because someone said that it's okay to establish such a tunneling um, mechanism here, but that will be the regular assumption for being on a JRC. Yeah. I think we can write text to that effect. Yeah, one, one thing to keep in mind is that uh, what I think uh, happens uh, right now is that the pledge will send just uh, basically, uh, yeah, DTLS records in UDP directly to the joint proxy. So it's not encapsulated in anything, not in co-op. It isn't even co-op. It's just uh, a DTLS record UDP message. And then the proxy basically forwards that encapsulated in something and gets the response back and then sends it back uh, as a pure DTLS record uh, to the pledge. So that's what you have yes. now. So I think we want to keep it that way, right? So we, we don't want to necessarily yeah, not, require co-op there. We're not changing that part. That We're not changing that part. This this dotted line over here looks like a, a co-APS and we're not changing that. It, it, yeah. it, this guy sees a port, you know, probably 5683, um, a DTLS connection and yeah, yeah. that's all. Yeah, that's, that's good. But um, I think what we did not have there is uh yeah for the discovery part at least we did not advertise a particular resource eh? we say only say there's co-op s and it's at this join port and it has a resource type and for the rest there do not need to be any resources uh, in that discovery because the pledge already knows the resources they are well known so they don't need to be advertised so right. maybe it's good to put section six to one on the screen for a moment. So that's where the yeah, discovery happens uh, by the pledge. I don't think I don't think I have that. Um... Not in slides. No. OK, then we yeah, can <laughs> show it. But I could pull it up if you want. Yeah. Uh, so so I'm going to I'll write some text. Uh, Esco, I'm going to ask you to review it and we're going to bring this to the anima and core working groups next week next month and um that'll be like our you know consensus this you know i hope we'll it'll be for final objections only or wordsmithing or something great okay good So um, thank you all. Um, I'm I'm going to reshare what we have here on the end. This is again. I always have to refresh. Apparently, yeah, okay. Every time refresh helps. I'm going back to this chair slides just to um, show them once again. And go to the agenda real quick. I should be, oh, okay, this is just very slow. Okay, um, so we have been going through that. So uh, thanks, core attendees, for uh, being so patient with us. And uh, thanks, IoT ops attendees, being so patient with core for this uh, uh, combined uh, joint meeting time. Um, the next item on the agenda is actually the first item that is a candidate for adoption, IoT Ops. Uh, we are talking about a lot of onboarding mechanisms in the last year. We have uh, isolated an interesting um, gap, I think. And uh, there is one draft that is currently illustrating that gap to some extent. And that could be the basis for a document we want to adopt and foster in IoT Ops to make that the first document you can look at and understand where is what in the IETF and what work could be done here additionally and what is already addressed. And I think, more, um, Brandon, that's you up next.
Yes, I think that is me up next. Okay, let me try to give Hopefully you the slide. Hopefully you can hear me okay. Uh, I can hear well, so that's a good thing. Uh, no, that is not what I want to do. And this is now... Oh, with the tablet, this is uh, always a few more clicks. I'm almost almost there. Here we go. Okay, so I have um, renamed this uh, the last time that I presented it. Um, Michael had some comments about the name, so there, there's a new name. We'll see if that's any better. Uh, ne next slide, please. Um, I'm not trying to define a normative draft. Um, this is essentially going to be informational, uh, not, not normative requirements, probably uh, a landing pad. The, the question is, who is this actually for? Next, please. So I don't think that we're looking for uh, a, a draft for implementers. Um, I don't think that uh, that library authors are going to read this. I think they would read the normative drafts instead. Um, some OEMs, which could be implementers, I suppose, uh, will likely want to know which drafts to use, how to find the libraries they need, um, and find solutions to the problems that they have. And users are almost certainly not going to look at this. Um, operators might want to know what to ask OEMs for. So there might be an element of, um, of compliance checking uh, from uh, IT departments and things like that as well. Next slide, please. Well, um, I, I know that there are varied opinions about uh, Anissa, but their uh, baseline security recommendations for IoT is pretty good. Um, and their take on uh, audience, uh, I thought was probably, you know, a, a, not a bad uh, parallel to what we probably need. Next slide, please. Um, so I think that there's a gap in the IETF, um, and that is we don't have a baseline security recommendations draft, at least not that I've discovered. Uh, there are a lot of drafts. Maybe I missed one. Um, Anissa's baseline uh, is, is pretty good, as I said, but it's a bit old now, and there are some, some modern threats that it doesn't address. And as a result, it is missing remote attestation and confidential computing. I think those are critical for the IoT and for the internet moving forward. So I think that those two elements on their own may well justify us producing our own draft uh, rather than just referencing one that exists. Uh, I think we may well need to produce our, our own. Um, we could reshape the, the draft that I've already written and, and make it a, directly a map of, of baseline security recommendations to IETF technologies, and, and that's probably worthwhile on its own. Um, there are other documents that we should review, um, but I want to crowdsource identification and review of, of other baseline requirements. So if, uh, if you have a particular one you think should be reviewed, um, please bring it to the list. Next slide, please. Uh, so the ones that I'm aware of already are the ANISA, the Etsy, and the NIST baseline uh, recommendation drafts. Um, I think that there are likely more out there. Next slide, please. So the uh, ANISA's baseline document, as an example, gives you a sort of a fuzzy IoT architecture. And, and that makes sense. You don't want to be too prescriptive about this. Um, it's more a question of establishing terminology that we use throughout the rest of it. Um, there are a lot of standard setting organizations have an IoT architecture document of some kind. Um, I have seen a few sort of cursory attempts at this in the IETF. There's probably something out of core that comes close to this, but I don't think I've spotted it yet. Um, if we don't have one, that would match this kind of thing. We probably need to either reference one or produce one. 
Uh, next. Uh, so then the next thing is a survey of common assets in IoT systems. And uh, I mean, this is the, the foundations for building a threat model. We need the assets so that we can build the threat model. Um, uh, there, there are probably some pointers to methodologies for identifying more assets, since we can never hope to have an exhaustive list. Um, what's really missing in, uh, sorry, uh, there's also uh, risks and threats to IoT systems. And uh, the draft that, um, the, the IoT Nets draft that I've uh, submitted is, uh, it has a lot of this kind of content, uh, common risks and threats to IoT systems. Uh, it doesn't point to methodologies for identifying more risks and threats. So maybe that's an area that could be expanded. Um, but what Anissa's baseline document is missing that I think we really need is IETF protocols and technologies that mitigate the risks and threats. And uh, th that is the primary content or the purpose of the content in my IoT Nets draft. Next slide, please. So if we do go through writing a baseline requirements document, we need to convey that this is all real. Uh, there, this is not a thought experiment about things that might happen. This is what will happen. These threats are real. They do exist, and they're, you know, this, you know, there, this is something that has to be taken seriously. Um, Anissa, in an attempt to make that point, uh, backed up pretty much everything with examples of real attacks. And I, I think that's an interesting approach. I'm not sure that's appropriate in the IETF, uh, but it, it does make the point pretty effectively. Um, on top of that, there's also the, the move towards legislation. So there's, of course, the, the National Cybersecurity, uh, sorry, National Security Memorandum on Cybersecurity uh, that came up not so long ago. And, and that's moved things forwards a bit. And in the UK, there's the DCMS's call for reviews on, oh, sorry, call for views on the cons consumer connected product cybersecurity. Uh, that's uh, it hasn't moved into legislation yet, but you know it, when the when a, a government department is exploring what legislation is needed, um, it, it's kind of a hint that there might be headed in that direction at some point. So that is another example where legislators are, are moving towards this. Next slide, please. Um, so baseline requirements are great. I've already mentioned we are missing pointers to uh, technologies that provide those requirements. Um, but there's always the question of, you know, if you start with baseline requirements, I mean, that's fine. But if you want to go the extra mile and produce, you know, something high security rather than baseline security, what do you do next? And I think that's another area where we've got an opportunity to say, you know, there's the baseline. And if you want to raise the bar, also do this. So there's some examples that we could probably use out of uh, technologies that improve past the baseline. And um, I think this would be a good environment for setting up that kind of a landing pad. Um, as I mentioned, we have a threat to draft mapping in uh, IoT nets, and I think that's useful even outside the context of baseline security requirements. So that's that's my um, that's my pitch for why we should ad adopt it. Even if we don't produce a baseline security requirement document, it's still useful as a threat to draft mapping, and I think that's still a useful thing to do. Next slide, please. So. Um, if, if I had my uh, ideal way that this, uh, this working group progressed, I, I would expect that we probably need um, a new baseline recommendation draft. Um, I think that that's one of the things that's missing in the IETF today. Uh, I think that we might need to, to do a little bit of architecture uh, terminology work, but that's that's it. I'm not sure about that one. I, I would welcome input. Um, the mapping for prominent drafts, I think, is is essentially where I want to go with IoT Nets. Um, should uh, the question is, should we adopt it? And would this work help us to identify any gaps and and produce a, an engine for producing uh, future work and and areas of protocol to ex explore since we may not have covered them yet. Uh, there we are. Uh, that's that's where I am with the IoT Nets draft today, and uh, 
I guess that raises a whole pile of questions. So um, go ahead. Michael, you are first in queue. So hi. Um, I guess what I'm hearing is that, and I haven't read the Anisa document, but um, <laughs> what I'm hearing is that this is actually a kind of a, a roadmap document to uh, the different protocols that we have, um, and I think that's actually a really useful thing. And from a um, from an outsider looking into the IETF. Um, you know, we have not done our IoT stuff in a particular place. Um, and so I think that's particularly useful to do. Now, this is very much security related. Um, and um, so, for instance, I think that while we think of software update as being a security thing, I don't know that the rest of the industry necessarily does. Um, and so I think that we should think a little bit about um, some other pointers that might uh, we might not think of it as a security. So, for instance, connections to some of the Elwig stuff, um, 7228 for terminology. Um, I, I'm OK if we produce a document which essentially has uh, a, a bunch of pointers to other things as to what is the current state of the art for this and. Um, and I'm also okay if we, if our document actually just, you know, if this ANISA document has really good actual threats, uh, that we, assuming it's easily readable, um, uh, that, you know, we actually refer to it directly. That would be fine with me. Yeah, I think, um, I'm quite happy to refer to a, another document if there's, uh, if there's adequate content in it. Um, what I am finding to be a problem with the ANISA document today is that it is five years old now. It was released in 2017. Mm -hmm. And that's okay, um, but remote attestation and confidential computing hadn't really started to take off at that point. And uh, the result of that is that they don't really make mention of it. And I think that moving forward is a bit of a problem because those are foundational technologies now. Uh, sorry, notwithstanding that, there's still a NIST document that I need to review um, and an Etsy document, well, sorry, that we need to review and an Etsy document that we need to review. And maybe between the three of them, there's something that is you know, more complete. Um, the ANISA document is reasonably consumable. It's written in pretty plain language. Um, the difficulty I have with it is that it is 100 pages long and um, getting through all of it is time consuming. And not that we're going to do better. <laughs> I suspect it'll be worse. <laughs> No, so this is Hank. Um, I want to wanna ask one question with no hats. So would that also extend, you were mentioning uh, remote attestation, confidential computing, uh, etc. Would that also extend to a more bro more broader concepts like zero trust architectures? Is that already mentioned in the NISA baseline? I'm, I haven't been through the whole thing cover to cover, so I'm, I, I'm yeah. not able to confidently say whether or not it does. I'm, I'm still working my way through a review of that document. If not, um, I think positioning um, some IATF work in that, I don't want to call it a buzzword, but uh, let's call it a domain of perception <laughs> would also be useful. But, um, but what I heard is that um, they also heard that the NISA document is big and, and also heard readability. And one of the chat comments here is that um, well, the threat labeling like threat.net.acl.broad is also not very readable. Yep. I, I understand that there seems to be some, some taxonomy here uh, in the naming convention, but, um, but I think the, the comments in chat are, are valid. So, so would you uh, think that uh, addressing that 
kind of threat taxonomy in a more readable way would be part of the work? Yes, I think that um, taking taking uh, Michael's comments um, in his review uh, that he presented at uh, 114, absolutely, we need to uh, revisit how um, the IoT Nets draft is is written. The taxonomy maybe doesn't need to be part of the titles, and and maybe there needs to be a taxonomy used separately or identified separately. Um, maybe the taxonomy is not relevant um, at all and can just be dropped. Um, I'm happy with with whatever feedback is is available on that. Um, my inclination was to leave um, some feedback. Uh, sorry, some uh, taxonomy in there so that we can sort of think about what applies to networks, what applies to end devices, you know, which which libraries are threats relevant against, things like that. Um, so I can see why there might be some need to, uh, to, to refine that a, a bit. Um, I just haven't done that work yet. That could be working group work. So um, everybody who's here in the room, um, I would like to pose another question. Uh, what I heard is we have two things, actually. We have the threat model. that, that That's kind of generic. And probably we, can, we don't have to start at zero with that. And then we have the baseline document that would refer to the IETF building blocks. So do you, Brandon, would you um, envision this as, as one document or would it be better to disentangle that? Maybe because if you would drop um, our own taxonomy, we could just inherit it from somewhere else. So, and, and that, would, that work would result in a non-published ID in the end where we, we experiment with that. And the baseline draft is basically the, the intended output that was, is more more set in stone, more more guaranteed. Is, is that a way forward, or how would you um, assume that would work out? Uh, I, I, I don't have any assumptions on that. <laughs> I think that okay. it would be, I mean, I'm happy with whatever the is the, the best result for the working group. I'm not you know tied to making sure this is adopted. As long as the, the mapping comes out, I think that the mapping is the important part. Mm-hmm. And the baseline security recommendations are probably important too, but there are a few copies of those already floating around in industry. Um, I think it's useful for us to uh, to have a bit of uh, IETF specific uh, recommendation. And I think the other thing uh, is that the you know a, a lot of them we're not sitting still, and a lot of the other ones are fairly static. They haven't been updated in the last know however many years um, I think that if substantial new uh, technologies come out in the IETF I suspect we will update this so I see the the you know the prospect of being a semi-living document being useful okay I see that Elliot trying to queue please go ahead Uh, good morning, good afternoon, um, good evening to some. Um, I agree with uh, Brendan that this is going to be a, a living document. And to prove the point, um, I don't know about this IETF, but probably next IETF, um, we'll be introducing some capability into SKIM uh, for doing IoT onboarding, um, specifically device onboarding. So I expect it would join the list. So I like the idea of a living, uh, living document, whether that's a draft, a web page, or what have you. I, I don't have a particularly strong view, um, but uh, I, I think we should keep in mind they're going. Your, your Brendan's point's exactly correct. So when we talk about provisioning there, for instance, while there's work going on in the IETF and EST, we've already done work in um, uh, EMU for this in two different forms. Uh, that we might want to list to, and um, one of which is uh, Noob, and the other one which is Teep. Teep has the same provisioning functions as uh, EST, only at L2. The only difference being nobody actually wrote the darn code, which is sort of annoying the crap out of me you know, for, in terms of provision. I'm going to go fix that, and then probably uh, come up with an update based on that. 
Thanks. So quickly looking at the chat. Um, so I know that we are in a relatively um, small subset of the typical IITF and Dindy group, but uh, I, I, just just to to help me a little bit here as a chair to to assess the room, I tried to phrase a raise hand thing, and and that is absolutely not, of course first of all not binding, not representative, just to get a feeling for the for the virtual room here. Um, I will press the start a session. I edited this twice, so probably there's a spelling error now in that. Um, I try to uh, do a raise hand if, because sometimes it's really not easy to understand when you want to have a raise a hand. Um, so, um, I uh, will not be able to see anything, I think, until, oh, if I scroll down, I can see something, okay. <clears throat> yeah, I'm using this from a tablet. Sharing from a tablet is an interesting experience. I can tell everybody who wants to share in, Meet Echo, uh, maybe don't. <laughs> I'll give this another five to ten seconds. Oh, no, yeah, I thought I've, I've seen the, the word roadmap there, but uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, I see, uh, you're correct. I, I don't, I actually, I actually would like to keep it at baseline and mapping. Roadmap always implies that we know what we want to go do next. And I, I'm not inclined to ask for, do we want to put plan into text form here? Okay. Um, and that's why roadmap in, in the English sense, um, but when I buy a roadmap in, in a store, that usually does not tell me how the, the roads will look like in 10 years that, that they show the roads. That's right. They're, they're, they're oh, the landscape. Okay, I, I yeah. see where you're yeah. going with this. Okay. So, so, yeah. that's, so, so and... that's, it describes things as they were when the map was published. Yes. And it's, they're often wrong, but uh, as long as roads aren't deleted, uh, they are still a good, it's still a good resource. <laughs> I, I think so too. So uh, I think the, the 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 two takeaways that we have here is that yes, we should talk about this. Definitely, there is some value perceived in the subset of attendees here. Um, so Brandon, um, that unfortunately means a few action items, aka work. Um, could you please recap the um, threat model baseline mapping items on the list in a concise message? So that we can then uh, talk about uh, uh, and then ask basically for adoption. So we can have a discussion on an adoption call uh, before. Um, um, I don't know if we can do an adoption call before the ITF meeting actually, but but we could start one in in uh, in London, and so that we can have a healthy discussion on the list uh, before then. Would that be comfortable? Would you would you would you be comfortable with that? So let me make sure I understand this correctly. The the ask yeah. is to um, make the point that the the draft I've written is a starting point for a map of um, a map of threats and use cases to IETF drafts that deal with them, um, and that that's useful, and we should adopt that. Um, yes and no. So yeah, yeah, that would be the minimal thing to do. But I think that's not what we want to work uh, on only as I, as far as I understood it now. So I think the the work is to uh, to um, um, use the examples you provided for baseline documents from uh, uh, Inisa Etsy and NIST, if I remember correctly, um, and and understand what their structure is. To, to condense them down into a, a either a, our own translated threat model or a referenced um, a reference system to their threat models and, and taxonomies, and then do the mapping to the IETF building blocks, which ultimately would steer also future work, because some things might not be mappable and expose gaps and, and, and items that we want to work on. 
So, but that, that, that's 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 my 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 assumption here. Would you agree with that? Okay, I, I understand what you're asking for now. Yes, when you say some work, that is a bit of an understatement, Hank. That is a <laughs> uh, pretty large project. I would appreciate any contribution that anyone else is willing to provide. Okay, what what what? So you said your item is, is scoped already, of course. Um, so, what uh, would you would you ask for adoption of your item and then put this to the working group and see how we can um, 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 interest other parties to other other individuals, or do you want to uh, add a uh, a scope by yourself um, when, um, when asking for adoption? So, I I think that this is. Um... I think I would prefer to adopt first and then, uh, you know, gather a few more authors and, and see what we can do at that point. That, that would be my preference. If that's not what's going to happen, that's okay. I'll, I'll do my best, but um, I'm not sure that I can get, I'm not sure that I can do a good treatment of all three of those documents in the <laughs> time available before the submission deadline. Oh no, not the submission deadline. That that is not the problem. So I think um, the the important thing here is to discuss this until London, and 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 in London we have a, we we are not under any pressure of of having an adoption call here. I think the more important thing is to have a healthy discussion, so get pe people aware of this, and then have a good uh, meeting session. And from that point on, I think uh, adoption can be steered pretty easily. So that would be my recommendation. And but I would always uh, highlight if you put something to the list that we are planning for adoption, and that at the last interim there was a um, twelve to two uh, um, um, hand raised thing that will be in the minutes or refer to the minutes. Uh, that is, uh, that seems to be a good idea. That's why we are now uh, um, pondering that uh, plan. So when when we okay. adopt something. Um, Automatically, a message is sent to a, a new work mailing list that goes to other SDOs and so on. Um, and I think it, that we should uh, really think about this this uh, the gating function of adoption here as as a way to indicate to other people that this work is being started and uh, that that the ITF is interested in in getting some some work done. There, so I I wouldn't wait until the the document is super wonderful. Um, of course, if the the document is misleading to uh, SDOs as to what kind of work we are trying to do here, that's also not good. Uh, but we we shouldn't fine tune the document uh, repeatedly until we finally adopt it. Fine tuning is is for for working group work. Yeah. So Karsten, would you have an opinion on? Uh... Uh, the time of an adoption call, because personally, I would feel more comfortable with having this agreed on at a, at a second, basically, at the uh, uh, at the meeting, while having the discussion on the list until the meeting, which is probably like a month or something. And so, uh, so would would that sound like a good time frame for a discussion and then call? Well, uh, we we're having a meeting, so. <laughs> uh... Uh, I think we, we, we have all we need to, to uh, decide here. What we don't have is a version of the document that, that really announces the, the direction we seem to be picking up. Uh, so what uh, I think we really want is a new revision of that document that, that doesn't magically do all the work. That, that's, of course, impossible. Um, but that is uh, uh, more indicative as to what, what we are now trying to achieve with this uh, document. And uh, I, I uh, would optimistically think that this actually can be uh, done before the 24th. Uh, so that mm -hmm. would be a great basis for actually starting an, an adoption uh, call before IATF. Then we can still discuss the results of that call at IATF. Excellent. Okay. Um, so, uh, Brenton, I see some support on the chat. So maybe have a look at that. So you are not alone. And I also think that other participants here uh, will comment and contribute. So would you be comfortable to try to remold um, the existing ID to capture the goals, at least, the, 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 the path forward uh, before the cutoff? And because 24th, by the way, 
in October is cutoff day. So that's why this is the, the deadline. Yes. Um, so I think uh, that I could um, sort of restructure the document a little bit to say, these are some of the baseline security documents that already exist, um, but they don't tell us which technologies to use to fill these gaps. Here are a list of technologies that fill some of the gaps, and um, maybe that will help us find some of the missing bits as well. Um, I think I could probably do that reasonably easily. Um, we can sort of park the threat model that I put in there for the moment if we're taking that approach, uh, because I'm not sure how much it overlaps with what's already there. Um, mm -hmm. And then that could be a question, perhaps that winds up in a different document in the future. That's fine. Okay. Um, are you incubating that on a GitHub repository with some I ID can't remember. Thing? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Because I think um, uh, getting help and, and getting this more visible, uh, GitHub would help. Yes. And, uh, and, 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 and just not only just highlighting the goals that you have with the ID uh, would help people here in the chat to, to uh, uh, maybe on board with that work. And and then have you um I'm getting the 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 initial stuff done, um, uh for for the uh, um, cutoff date. And Michael, no, I don't think we have a GitHub organization yet. That's an excellent point, uh, because we don't we didn't have had documents yet. I think. Um, so uh, I would initially would put that in the uh, in the GitHub in the in the individual realm of of of, of uh, participants here, but uh, I can also in parallel find out um, how to get the IoT ops IoT ops GitHub uh, organization. Okay. So uh, are there any more comments on the plan, or are there uh, um, like say concerns? The way forward we just uh, highlighted here. If that is not the case, I can give you a lot of our respect because I think we discussed agenda item two or three also now, um, which is oh, and there's Michael in the queue. So, isn't there this report we're supposed to do for the IESG? Um, yeah, we did that in, in the case of that we reported to the ADs, um, but we did not create a document for that. But I think um, this um, activity right now could be an update to that. And we, we, can, we could phrase it in a document format, um, but we, we did not write an ID-based, uh, ID-framed uh, um, um, report the last time. So, um, so that's... Um, that's something, but I think you're correct. Uh, this activity on the list could be, we could summarize as chairs uh, for the ISG again. But I think there's no, um, how you call it, there's no template for that because uh, I think that that's not been done before. I'm looking at the chat right now. Well, I'm just thinking, so maybe you should just share whatever you said to the chairs with the working group as I'm at email. Then, what what I, what we can do is we can we can summarize the, the 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 state of the affairs up to this date and and put that to the list. That that would be absolutely fine, I think. Okay, I just I just understood that we were in risk of being dechartered if we didn't do this soon. Uh, well, we 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 were at the last ITF meeting. We had a. At least Alexei and I were with the, the ADs, but Alexei might have something to say about that also. Um, yeah, I think we need to check with uh, our AD that. Yeah. Uh, but the, the last I, feedback I, I got was that, quite positive. I did, so, yeah, I didn't think we, we need to write something, but I don't think we've had much cycles to, to actually do anything. Yeah. Yet. But but yeah, okay, we're, we're absolutely. Uh, that's a good point. Uh, to be, be transparent on reporting about this is fine. But but to, to some extent, all, all the recordings, minutes, and 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 threat and that visible list activity is is this report to some extent. But we can we can uh, provide a summary, 
and and we could provide it in a written form. But but what exactly format it is, we have to check with with our IDs again. And I'm sure there are lots of um, area directors on IHG who who would like to know, but not necessarily paying attention on a daily basis. So I think some summary would be nice. Sure. Let's, let's target that for the cutoff. I think that's a good thing. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, Michael, for bringing that up. I was not aware that uh, uh, that was perceived as missing. And thank you, Brendan. I was looking at the chat for um, uh, getting a, a GitHub repo for that individual um, ID started. Uh, again, in parallel, we will uh, uh, check for creation of an um, IoT Ops GitHub organization. Having no said all that, is sorry, is there are there other other comments open? Someone wants to get to the mic. Going once, going twice. That's not the case. Uh, we can give you a lot of time back. We have a few action items done. Uh, we, will, we will continue discussion on the list. And thank you for attending. Thanks, everyone. Thank you all.